gentlemen, today I'm going to show you guys how I shim and tune an AG gearbox to a standard that I'm happy to sell to a customer. So something that I know is going to last at least a couple of years before you're uh, maybe worrying about replacing a tappet spring or a main spring because you've gone absolutely ham on it and used it every single day uh, for two or three years um, and now it's slightly lower FPS. Uh, so there are a couple of things that we do want to focus on, a couple of main points. Uh, but as long as you, there's, there's no secret magic techie source here. There's doing it right, checking your work and double checking it before you put it back together to make sure that you have done it right. There is double, triple, quadruple checking and not skipping steps like a lazy cunt. So let's get into it. So, first things first, you cannot shim a gearbox properly with lube or oil on your gears. You need to degrease them and dry them off. They need to be completely dry or you're not going to be able to shim them accurately. Um, any debris, dirt, oil, any layer of oil is going to, we're, we're, we're talking increments of 0.1 or 0.05. Th th those are very, very, very small increments and a layer of grease is enough to offset that. So I'm going to assume that you've got nice uh, degrease dry gears. Now the other thing is shims. I only use stainless steel 0.1 mil shims i don't i don't use any bigger than that i don't stack them up um, this is what i recommend um, but in order to use stainless steel shims you need to use um, very good quality hardened cnc bushings um, which isn't a problem if you're using a nice retro arms gearbox or if you i i recommend the retro arms gearboxes any CNC 7075 gearbox and CNC hardened bushings, you're fine. Th those are my minimum recommendations um, for internals. Anything less quality than this, it's, it's not going to last as long. So I'm actually going to take a shim out of there. These are already shimmed. I'm going to take a shim out of there and add it to my little pile of shims. And we're going to shim this to the gearbox. So step one is to individually, doesn't matter what order, we're going to individually shim each gear to the box. So putting both halves on like this without screwing it together will give us a general, very general sense of shimming. Um, but that tolerance is going to change when we tighten it up. So we do have to tighten it up to check it properly. A little pile of shims. Ooh. So all we're doing to initially shim it to the gearbox is stacking on shims until it's too tight and then taking them off. It is that simple. Unfortunately, you do have to do it by screwing and unscrewing the gearbox a few times. The only way to get an accurate judge on tightness or the tolerance that the gearbox will have when it is tightened is by tightening it. Very simple, very tedious, and unfortunately this is why a lot of techs That's too tight now. If I take a single shim off, it should spin totally freely. I always like to do that sort of slowly just to make sure I'm not flicking shims everywhere. 
So I'm going to take a single shim out of there if I can separate one without flicking shit everywhere. Make sure that is just a single shim. Again, double, quadruple, triple checking everything. should be able to feel that very, very, very slight movement with your fingers. That's what we're after. That's that 0.1 mil. Now I can't really show it on camera. It doesn't, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling thing. But you should be able to get that level of tightness or looseness, free spinning, um, with a single 0.1 mil shim making it not friends spin speedily, spin freely. Um, so the other thing here um, that may be off-putting for some people is uh, because everything is dry. Now this may actually, um, you may shim too loose because of this. This isn't an issue. So while everything's dry and I've reached that level of shimming that I'm happy with, if I spin this too hard, there we go. It's gonna screech like that. So all that screeching is, is there is no lube in between the shims. Uh, I'm not gonna lube it now just because I wanna pull the gearbox apart a bunch more to show you guys some things. But the second we add a little bit of grease or lube to these, that goes away. So it's, it's really important that I explain that because when you're building it for yourself and you encounter that, you're gonna hear that and go, no, I've done something wrong. You haven't, it's just because everything is dry. So that's a shimmed gear. I'm gonna put that shim away back in its little bag so I do not mix it in with my shimmed, my actual shimmed gears. So our next step is meshing our pinion and bevel. Now this is an important one. Pinion and bevel gear. So we are gonna get our height by screwing the motor into half of the gearbox. But that is only going to give you your height. You are not going to get an accurate gauge on the actual mesh uh, between these two without it being screwed fully together with the handle on because the tolerance of the gearbox changes. So. You can chill there. I need some motor screws. Sorry guys. Be 
be funny if this wasn't even recording. I just wasted all this time. Okay, so we've got half a gearbox here. Well, now we're gonna put our bevel gear. Our shell. So I did actually have a look. I don't recall if I actually did the height on this. I'm pretty sure I did. It should be accurate. Okay, so what we're looking for, if I can turn it sideways, is for our curves on each gear. So you can see that the bevel has a curvature to it. So you want to meet those curves on each side of each gear and you want the perfect height um, or the mesh itself, you want the bevel to be sitting the perfect height to not be touching and be 0.1 or oh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 mil um, gap in between the teeth of the pinion. So I can't really get that on camera. So I'm gonna take a photo and put it up on screen for you guys so you can see properly because that's just not cutting it. Um, so all we're getting from this step here is how far upwards we're going to adjust. And I actually like that. So I did, yeah, I, I did adjust that one. Once we're done with that, once we're done adjusting the height, a little dab of super glue on the bottom of the screw so it doesn't um, undo itself from vibration or heating up from the motor. Okay, so I am happy with that. I knew that was going to happen. Yeah. He can go well away from our equipment. So the next step is we need to put the gearbox together. And test our mesh. And this is the exact same as any normal shimming. Well, I work off the point one, which we've just seen with the sector gear. So this is the exact same between the contact here, between this and, well, our pinion gear. I want point one worth of gap in between the teeth on this and the teeth on this guy. Okay, now this one I can show you because it's a sound and visual.
So this is the ideal amount of movement. And I want it so that if I put another 0.1 mil shim on here, that will be too tight. Or sorry, if I move a shim from this side to this side, it'll be too tight on the pinion gear. So that is, in my opinion, the best possible surface area coverage you can get for energy transfer between these two gears. If it doesn't sound like that, if you, if you don't have that free movement that is then too tight from 0.1 mil, or from moving 0.1 mil upwards, go back and start, start again. Reshim this gear. Alright, so that was a little bit tedious, but we got there. So now that we've done that, we can tune our tapper plate. Okay, now our final step is to actually mesh the gears to each other. I don't know why I pointed to the dog tag. Apparently I'm meshing that to the other gears. Oh, come back. any shims so ideally we want about 0 0.2 0 0.3 I don't really like to go under 0 0.2 purely because we're accounting for the very very slight movement of the gears if you have less than a 0 0.2 mil gap in between the cogs of our gears, um, they can brush into each other and touch each other, which is absolutely not not what we want. That is the opposite of uh, good surface area coverage. So I'm gonna put our spur gear in. And go in here, and we'll put our sector gear in if I can grab my shims back. So if I hold them on cat, no, that's not gonna work. I'm gonna have to put them together for you to see. Sorry guys, I'm trying to not blast myself in the eyes with light, but also show you the gap between the gears there. Ooh. Come on buddy, focus. Come on, you got this. You can see just under the sector gear, there we go. There's about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 mil worth of clearance between that gear between those two gears. And we have very, very good surface area coverage of the teeth being able to touch each other. Sorry for blasting you in the uh, eyes, guys. That's, oh! 
don't go into the light. Okay. Put that torch away. So that is what we want for a mesh between gears. So now that we have meshed our bevel and pinion, I mesh the spur gear to the bevel, and then I mesh the sector gear to the spur gear. Totally gonna lose some shims. Nope. Now our other part of this, our final piece, is actually our piston. This definitely accounts for our mesh. So what we're gonna find, and this is another recommendation, thick rail pistons only now. They allow for a much, much wider range of uh, leeway with meshing because you have double the fucking width on your piston. So the final piece is making sure that our sector gear can't clip this guy. Um, whoop. So if you do any sort of adjustment, I don't really space out my piston heads too much anymore. Um, depends on the build. What you'll find is that first tooth can actually get in the way. Especially if you are dealing with uh, 50 plus RPS and shit is moving exceptionally quick. Um, you can clip this on its way back to me. So, I do like to take a little bit off that guy there. Off that first tooth. Just in case. So, AOE. I find these piston heads, again, preference. I really like these piston heads and they give me awesome AOE to begin with. So, not really an issue. Uh, not something that I'm gonna go into because that is a uh, personal preference thing. And I really, really like these piston heads. And just while we're at it, while we've got him side to side here, we can actually have a look. So you do have to hold your piston a little bit. We can actually see where our sector gear is going to um, where the cogs are going to meet on the piston. Now, Sabin. Your fucking tapper plate. Okay. So we've shimmed and meshed our gearbox. We're happy with the mesh uh, with all of our gears. So I... I'm going to show you guys... One of the biggest things that the, uh, all these other techs are not going to tell you because they think it's some kind of, um, what's the word? They, they, they think it's, uh, one of their super smart things that they've figured out. Gels are bigger than BBs. 7mm is bigger than 6mm. Can we agree on that? Yeah. So, a normal tapper plate is designed to move forward and back around a six mil fucking ball. Gels are not a six mil fucking ball. As we've previously discussed, there are seven to eight mil fucking ball. So what that means for us is that, he's not even gonna go all the way forward. We need to add an extra 
mil or so of forwardness and an extra mil or so of backwardness. How do we achieve this? I'm going to fucking show you. So we need to DIY our tapper plates a little bit, which is no big deal. Easy peasy. So to start off with, the Retro Arms Gel Blaster gearboxes actually already come with an extra two and a half or three mil. I think it's two mil. Whatever. They come with an extra amount of space milled out of the front so your tapper plate can go forward further. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. What they don't do is make your tapper plate travel back from backward further. So in with an airsoft gearbox, this is all this is all the movement we need. Right here. We don't even need it to go all the way back. There's still gap there. That's all they're designed for. And on top of that, on in actual function, when you have a spring pulling that, it's further forward. So that's about the peak of our cycle, normal. Um, yeah, that's uh, not gonna not gonna feed a gel, is it? So what we need to do is pretty simple as well. Push that all the way back. Have a look at what we're missing. So this it is this is a little bit finesse because you do have to take into account the flex of the tapper plate. So I can see from looking at that cycle there, there is a little teeny bit of gap there that needs to be filled in. So typically, just generally, you're going to be adding a little bit of material from here up at an angle and then working it back till it is perfect fit for your cycle. Um, these are my two preferred tapper plates. They are the exact same. They've come from the same um, the exact same mold, so one of them is ripped off the other one. Uh, they're made with the exact same plastic. The light blue one is a fighting bro, the dark blue one is an element. They are the exact same type of plates, um, and I really, really like how strong they are. So, how do we add material to this? Well, ideally, you want some four to five hundred dollar engineering epoxy resin. Uh, but that is super fucking expensive. So, I'm going to give you the tried and true, on par with very, very fucking expensive engineering resin. Danny Method, that came to me from my friend Raniel, who is our... Um, he makes fun of me a lot because I'm really good at this shit and he doesn't understand it but he's also an engineer and he's very smart and doesn't understand why i can do this better than he can so thank you Renil, for this tip i love you but fuck you but i love you you're gonna get yourself some cyanoacrylate cyanoacrylate however the fuck you say it it has to be pure cyan cyanoacrylate so there are a whole bunch of different super glues. A lot of them have uh, like a polymethyl mix or whatever. If you look in the ingredients, if they even list the fucking ingredients on them, this is one of the cheapo 10 packs from Coles. On your Coles. Um, it is pure cyanoacrylate. Absolute perfect for bonding with this sweet, sweet cocaine powder with this baking powder. No, it's not cocaine. So when you mix, now this is, this is tried and true uh, in every, in every technical industry. <coughs> this is tried and true in every single technical industry uh, for 
since the dawn of men figuring out how to stick shit together. Pure cyanoacrylate plus baking powder equals a mixture that is stronger than cement and technically somewhat flexible, like it can take vibration. That is your DIY cheapo method of adding material to a tapa plate. You gonna focus? Come on, buddy. There we go. So adding material on, easy peasy. Taking it off, very finesse. All we're gonna do is add a line of super glue at a time and sprinkle it with baking powder. You can look that up online, whatever. Or alternatively, just go get yourself a fucking $500 bottle of uh, engineering resin um, and just add a little bit of it. And you do want to score up the surface that you're adding it onto first. Um, now it is sort of an overnight process. Um, you do want to let set, yeah, let everything set properly. But once you have a solid chunk, you can then custom shape it to your cycle to have the perfect cycle. Now the way we're gonna test this is, it's really simple. Um, You're gonna pull your tapper plate back. So put in a sector gear, you don't need the spur gear in there. Put in the sector, put in the tappet and piston and nozzle, of course. And push or pull the tappet back to full extension. What you're gonna find when you first put that material on, it's obviously not gonna, it's gonna get really, really tight. So I like to just do this a few times till it pulls our tappet plate back, reaches a little point of tightness, and then releases. Like so. So that is definitely being pulled back fully. And it's a little bit tight there now. But I can just push it off. I don't want to lose any shims. Boom, boom. That is a fully tuned and ready to rock and roll tap it play. So whatever techie secret stuff you want to um, you want to say about it, it's not really. You are just reshaping a tappet so that it can move back further to, a, yeah, to accommodate a bigger gel. That is going to solve all of your feeding problems and with a stock SHS return spring you can comfortably feed, oh, with a couple of coils chopped off it, you can comfortably feed up to 40 50 RPS. As long as everything is shimmed right and meshed properly, you're going to have a device that lasts you for years and years and years, and the only things that you're going to be replacing are a tapper plate spring or a main spring. Alright, there you go guys. Anything I've forgotten, obviously blast the fuck out of me in the comments, but in my opinion, these are the main things you need to know to have a decent system that is going to last as long as it possibly can. Obviously, yeah, I recommend using the higher quality parts, but even applying these principles to the lower end stuff, you're gonna get a hell of a lot longer out of them than you would stock. Uh, there's not a single stock blaster or stock 
airsoft blaster gun on the market that I wouldn't be pulling apart and scrutinizing very closely before using. Um, but those are my thoughts. But if I'm wrong, if you think I'm wrong, fuck you for starters. But yeah, tell me why I'm fucking wrong. If I've given you at least one little bit of useful information in this video, you kind of owe me a like and subscribe. And if you don't, you're a piece of shit. You're, an, you're just a fucking degenerate shit cunt. I love you guys. Peace.